My name is Renee, my pronouns are he, him. And normally I'm zooming in from right around the corner from EBMC in Oakland, but today I'm on the lands of the Kumeyaay people, also known sometimes as San Diego. And so just feeling into being supported by these lands, being supported by the Kumeyaay people who are still here and whose culture is still very alive. Um, here where I am right now. So feeling the gratitude and support of um, being on these lands and um, just feeling into listening. How is it for me to be here practicing, teaching, live it like living, playing on these lands? So tonight, um, some of these, what we were just talking about, this like flow of giving and receiving is what we'll be exploring through practice, specifically through the practice of the seven homecomings, which originates with Lama Rod Owens. That's in his book, Love and Rage. And I'm actually right now in a course with him around the seven homecomings. So I'm um, feeling particularly excited to share it with you all. Uh, the practice is very alive for me in this moment. And then we'll explore in the talk, how is it to cultivate a, this practice of receiving, of really receiving from our benefactors, from our ancestors, from the land, from our teachers, our community and more. So we'll be um, exploring this topic of receiving care and support through this practice of the seven homecomings. And also some of how actually very challenging the practice can be. So if you find it hard, you're not alone. Um, I find it uh, quite also quite a, a practice that I really keep working with and, um, and which isn't always easily accessible. So if it feels like, wow, I don't know how to access this. Yeah, you're, that's a very normal experience. And so to like um, offer, I offer myself and I invite you to offer yourself to rest in that the practice is doing what it needs to do, even in moments when it feels like, um, like it may not be showing up. But we're just inviting it is, is a practice in and of itself, just inviting the support like planting the seeds and we'll keep watering them through practice. I wanna invite you into, we're gonna move into the practice itself and um, it'll be in practice for about 25 minutes. And as we move into practice, I first invite you just to check in with yourself, with your body. Is there anything that you need in this moment to be a little bit more comfortable, to support your practice. And I invite finding the balance that's right for you between really having your body be supported, resting, comfortable, bringing ease as much as is possible, and also um, bringing in the energy or alertness of practice and for each of us that's different. So I invite you to be your best guide into what supports your body for this practice. I'm just making any adjustments that you need or just taking a drink of water or um, getting a prop or a blanket, moving to another position. And also here at the beginning of our practice period, I invite you to really turn towards your intentions. Just taking a moment to be with our intentions for practice. 
really asking this question. I like to ask myself this question, why am I practicing right now? And knowing there's no wrong answer, but that tuning into the why brings, sometimes it brings clarity, support to my practice. And it may be the why is to really give myself my full attention. It may be to bring some ease to my experience. It may be to, out of a commitment to do less harm to myself or others, this commitment to harmlessness, it may be out of a longing for liberation and freedom for myself and for others and for our world. And there may be other reasons, just tuning into the why for a moment as we begin our practice. And one more invitation as we are here beginning our practice, and that's to meet our sensations in some way, in a way that feels accessible to you. It may be just feeling the weight of your body on whatever it's resting on, feeling that pressure, that feeling of gravity holding us to the earth. It may be inviting a couple of deeper breaths, really noticing the sensations of the breath in the body. Or it could be turning, tuning into sounds or to the visual field. We may have our eyes open or closed and if we have a soft gaze, that can be another place to tune in the sensations. We just meet our experience in this present moment through our sensation. So just taking another few moments in silence to anchor ourselves in our sensations in whatever, with whatever anchor feels most accessible to you. And now we're going to move into the practice of the seven homecomings. I will be inviting in these seven refuges or homecomings, or we may think of them as our benefactors. And as I invite them, I also invite you to kind of guide yourself through the practice in the way that feels best to you. It may be visualizing or inviting internally these homecomings. It may be just listening, receiving the words and noticing what arises. And we can also just invite an aspiration of these homecomings coming into our practice, into our awareness. And it may be that there's just one or two that really resonate with you in this practice, and that's great. And if you find one that resonates, you may choose to stay with it. You don't have to move on to the next. So I invite you to, as I'm guiding this practice, I also invite you to guide yourself and really find in this practice what works for you and leave what doesn't. The first homecoming I invite in is 
the teacher, guide, mentor. We may invite in the historical Buddha as a historical person or as this idea of our human potential for awakening. We may also invite or be visited by teachers who've been important to us, mentors, guides. They may be human or unhuman or um, beyond the human realm, unseen. They could be ancestors, deities, spirits. It may be plants or trees from the natural world. We're inviting in those teachers who have really cared for us, supported us, who are wholeheartedly here for our well being and our liberation. We may just invite within ourselves, any teacher who has supported and cared for me and who is invested in my well-being and liberation. And we may just see who shows up or we may be planting an invitation for these teachers, guides, mentors to show up in the future. and inviting the teachers, guides, and mentors to begin to make a circle of care and support around us. And that may be through visualizing them around us. It may be that we just have a felt sense of their presence. Or it may just be this letting this invitation, this aspiration be present. And next I invite in the second homecoming or refuge of the Dharma or our wisdom texts. Here inviting in really the words or images, poetry, songs that have been an inspiration to us that have helped bring clarity, guidance on our path. It may be teachings, works of art, works of literature, movies, songs that have helped us to feel seen, feel cared for and supported. Inviting these wisdom texts, these sources of wisdom, to come and be part of this circle of care and support that we are forming around ourselves. It may be the image of sitting in a comfortable chair in a library that we've spent time in or sitting in a space with beautiful art We're sitting and hearing beautiful music, inspiring, heart opening music. Any of these are the kind of circle that we're building around ourselves, the circle of care and support with these sources of wisdom that have offered us clarity, inspiration, energy for our path.
And next I invite in the third homecoming or refuge of community or Sangha. Inviting into this circle of care and support the communities that have supported us, have cared for us. We may bring our awareness to the community that we're a part of right now, POC Sangha, the East Bay Meditation Center, inviting in any communities, groups that have helped us to feel seen, supported, cared for, and where we also have been able to offer that presence, care and support to others. And it's possible in inviting this that it may feel like this isn't something available right now or that we don't have those kind of communities of mutual care and support that we long for. And just inviting, inviting this for ourselves in the future. And knowing that just the longing for this is so wholesome and a part of bringing it into our lives. And as we've invited in these communities that have cared and supported, cared for and supported us, whatever shows up is the right thing and they join our circle of care and support. And knowing too that if there isn't an image or felt sense of the circle of these homecomings, that that's totally okay. Or if there's just one who's shown up so far, that that's perfect. And we can continue to work with exactly what's showing up. And continuing on to the fourth homecoming or refuge of ancestors and lineage, inviting in only those ancestors who are wholly here to support our well being and our liberation. And for any ancestors who are not here to support us, to care for us, that we say no, they're not invited into our circle of care and support. And these ancestors may be from our own family lineage. They may be known or unknown ancestors. They may be our ancestors of affinity, our queer, trans movement, ancestors, maybe the ancestors who have cared for the lands that we live and practice on. Really inviting those who have come before us and have really made our lives, our freedoms, our joys possible. Inviting also those who have come before us in any lineage that's important to us. It can be in our spiritual lineage, 
or our artistic lineage or our movement lineages, just recognizing all of those who've come before us, who've lit the way, who've made our lives possible. Knowing that these ancestors, these lineage holders, have done what they did in part because they love and support us and because they want us to be free. Just inviting these ancestors and lineage holders to be part of our circle of care and support. And I invite in next the fifth homecoming or refuge of the earth. And here we may feel the earth right here under us, supporting us, caring for us. We may tune into and invite the sense of the concrete ways the earth is taking care of us, feeding us, offering us shelter, support, medicines, clothing, clean water to drink, giving us so many gifts and inviting also into our circle of care and support, the natural world, our allies and plant, plants, animals, trees, fungi, rocks, inviting maybe places that have loved and supported us to be part of our circle of care and support. And I invite in next the sixth homecoming or refuge of silence. Inviting the silence that supports our practice. The silence of the pause. Of listening. And this can also, I experience this silence sometimes as just space, like the spaciousness of the sky, the cosmos, the sense of mystery, that which is beyond words. Inviting this silence, this spaciousness to be part of our circle of care and support. And finally, I, uh, I invite in the seventh and final homecoming or refuge of ourselves. Inviting in the ways that we care for ourselves. The ways that we can show up for ourselves with our presence, our care. We may even offer ourselves love. We can see ourselves be our own good guide and teacher. And also inviting ourselves to be held in the center of this circle of care and support. Really placing ourselves in the center 
with any of these benefactors or refuges or homecomings that have shown up for us tonight. Can we just receive from them? I invite you to imagine yourself just marinating in any care and support that is available from these homecomings, these benefactors. And if that receiving isn't feeling available right now, just knowing that that's no problem, it's very normal. And we just did plant the seed that we may be able to receive this care and support that is present for us in the future. And Noah, and I invite you also to remind yourself or tell yourself, I am deserving of this care and support. This care and support is for me. I am worthy of being cared for, of being loved and supported by these benefactors, these refuges and homecomings. And just noticing how it is to say that to ourselves. I also invite you to notice if there's any gratitude or appreciation that is arising in inviting in this care and support as we feel any support that's shown up for us here in this practice. Just noticing if there's also some gratitude, some appreciation that just arises we don't need to make anything happen. Just tuning in and noticing if it's present. And if it's not, no problem. Just leaving some space for it. And as we come to the end of this practice, I invite you to just thank the elements of your practice. Just thank yourself from practicing. Maybe thank the seat or support for supporting you. Thanking the breath for sustaining our practice and sending our thanks in any other direction that feels called. And as we move out of the practice, I invite you just to bring in some very gentle movement, maybe just moving the hands or feet, if your eyes have been closed, opening the eyes and looking around your space, we might invite a little bit of just a rocking or some gentle stretch. As I get started with the Dharma sharing piece, I just wanted to say happy Pride Month to you all. And um, no, we're getting into June. Um, and of course, we're celebrating pride all the time. 
but a little extra reason to, to celebrate and recognize that right now during June. And also I wanna recognize just, you know, the level of attacks that are happening right now, especially on trans, non-binary, genderqueer, gender expansive people. There's nothing new, nothing new, but you know, it's particularly, um, yeah, I mean, it's unsettling, it's scary, it's, um, I certainly feel the impact of it myself, just seeing, you know, state after state passing legislation that's limiting healthcare for trans people in general, for trans kids in particular. And um, yeah, and I, part of why I really wanna focus on this piece that I'm bringing in tonight about how do we receive care and support um, in our practice, really recognizing that this is what is being target, one of the things that's being targeted is our care, our support. Um, the ways that we, you know, uh, really have a right to care and support in our world that we don't often receive. And, um, and I think for me, it feels like a revolutionary act to really tune in to the care and support that I do receive and to like declare myself loved and supported. Um, I might not even believe it when I say those words, but I still am like declaring that in a world that wants to say that I'm not um, and wants to take those things away from me. So it, yeah, so it feels like uh, another way that I'm kind of like bringing energy into my practice because it can be like, fuck you. I'm cared and supported, cared for and supported. Um, and I'm tuning into all of the ways and all of the beings that are offering me that care and support. And, you know, just to say like, it's, you know, it's nothing new, it's not, it's like part of the playbook of dominance culture of racial capitalist heteropatriarchy to really go after um, particularly those who don't conform in terms of gender, those who are not um, cis white men. And that's, that's very much part of this dominance culture. It's very much part of the over culture to, to be reinforcing those binaries, reinforcing the hierarchy there. Um, the hierarchy over, of men over everyone else, the hierarchy of um, kind of the default identities, um, whiteness, maleness, cis, gender, heterosexuality. And, and then for me, what's the antidote to this dominance culture actually is a culture of care or a culture of nurturance. And um, one of the things I've been really reflecting on, I also do work in restorative just do restorative justice work, um, working with people often who've caused harm and helping them to really understand the impact of what they've done. One of the things I get to see kind of in story after story is that um, it's hard to offer something that we haven't received ourselves. Like it's hard to offer empathy when we ourselves haven't received empathy. It's hard to offer care and nurturance when we ourselves haven't received it. And so I feel like this is another reason that this practice of really tuning in to the care that I am receiving, um, you know, like the one that's very accessible to me is feeling the care I received from the earth. And that's a place, the earth, the natural world, nature, plants, animals, trees have always been an easy place for me to go and feel loved and cared for, to feel safe, to feel my nervous system just settle right down. Um, 
and he really came to realize at some point that like my like secure parent was nature was the place that I went to to really feel safe and seen and um like I could be myself and everything was okay so that's that of all of all of the homecomings that's the one that's just very accessible to me every time I land on the earth I'm just like boom I feel cared for and supported and for others it may be different ones that feel more accessible but just to, to take like even just to work with what already feels accessible and to tune into it to just you know um I first started practicing seven homecomings myself when L Lama Rod's book came out the book love and rage which was I feel like it was early in the pandemic and now I don't remember the date exactly but you know I just like got it I read it right away and I started practicing with that practice in particular and it just felt so like helpful supportive nourishing also so hard to do um like i was thankful for having this connection to earth because it really gave me an entry point into it and then there were also times when I, like at first working with ancestors just felt like oh my gosh all of the ancestors i know about are not people i want anywhere near me and to find ways into inviting the care and support of ancestors was a real challenge. Um, but just keeping with the practice, keeping with it, and cultivating this part of me, like kind of just building the muscle of receiving, like I'm going to keep inviting this care and support, even when I can't feel it at all because I'm sort of building my capacity to receive that. And it feels like me building that capacity is actually, um, it's like a revolutionary act. It is in the you know culture that we're in right now, it is exactly the opposite of what some of these forces who are really trying to take the take away our care it's exactly the opposite of what they want for me to feel loved and cared for and for me to cultivate that within myself so I just start out in that place because it's for me the why of practice is always really helpful it's a place where I can really kind of keep connecting with my practice when I think about how is my practice part of the world I'm trying to create and in this case it's like I'm really trying to create this world that shifts away from this culture of dominance and hierarchy into a culture of reciprocity and care and relationship and so trying to start with myself in that can i can i treat myself in that way and um and also like notice that there are stories that are very deeply embedded and um in my experience uh, around not being cared for and am i how am i countering like actively countering those stories by just even simply turning tuning in and saying the earth is caring for me right now the earth has cared for me today by giving me you know delicious healthy food and clean water and a place to rest and the medicines that i need so many more things. So just, yeah, I'm just going to pause there for a moment and just um, inviting this reflection on how are we cared, and, cared for, supported, and how might that be counter to some of our stories that we hold internally, as well as the stories that we're receiving from the external world. Yeah, and I, I want to um, just also share, like, for me, I have a particular 
really strong story around not being cared for. And it really comes out of like an early childhood experience where like some real literal not being cared for happened. Um, you know, where I was, um, you know, born into very interesting times and in, in, in growing up in San Francisco in a community of mostly black and brown civil rights activists. So they called themselves revolutionaries in those days. And people who are working, you know, who are part of the protests at San Francisco State to create the first ethnic studies program, people who are working to get black and brown youth out of detention centers. Um, they didn't call themselves abolitionists, but that is very much the kind of work that they were doing. And um, in the midst of all of this beautiful struggle, there was also just a lot of chaos. And that was something that really impacted me in the very early years of my life. And often there were times when things were very unstable, where we didn't have stable housing, where, um, you know, like I, nobody even, I don't even know how many places I lived before I was 18. Like there's nobody who know, has that information between my parents and myself, like we can't patch it together because we just moved around so much and um, had so much instability. And also there was, you know, drugs and mental illness and all kinds of things. And so, yeah, so I was like, I came into the world and I wasn't really sure that I was loved or cared for, even though my parents did love me, but they didn't really have the capacity to do that very basic care. Just that very basic care of being present with me, seeing me, protecting me, and sometimes even like feeding. Sadly, even feeding and sheltering sometimes was a struggle. So, yeah, so I got a real strong story um, just right in my welcome into the world that, you know, I couldn't rest into that basic care and protection that every child deserves. And so it's been a real journey for me in terms of how do I repair? How do I really learn to care for myself? Kind of do, you know, using one kind of language, I think of it, it's been helpful for me to think in terms of like attachment healing, that I have some deep attachment wounding around having not had the kind of secure, stable care um, that hopefully every child would have. So I have to do this, like this healing for myself and practice has been a big part of that. Um, different kinds of healing modalities like somatics and attachment repair and many other things have been really helpful. And, and I don't think like I don't think that like practice by itself is everything that we need for our healing. We think like drawing from all of these modalities is really helpful. And also I am finding in this kind of benefactor practice, like some real healing for myself that, you know, definitely is supported by other kinds of therapy and stuff like that. And this piece around, you know, just particularly was reflecting on kind of how did I cultivate this piece of really being able to receive from my benefactors? I remember when I think back to just beginning my own meta practice, the practice of loving kindness, we use the Pali word metta, is um, kind of one of the core heart practices, um, at least in the insight or Theravada tradition that I've learned in. Um, so a part of that practice of loving kindness is we often do um, our loving kindness practice in seven directions. And one of them is the benefactor. That's often where we're invited to start. Start with the benefactor, start with someone who you've received a lot from, because that person is gonna be easy to extend our good wishing towards because we've received so much, which is kind of like a mirror of that piece of like recognizing that we need to receive often, we need to receive care or empathy or nurturance in order to be able to offer. And when I started that practice, that benefactor practice, I was like, I cannot think of anybody who 
you know, I haven't, they cannot think of any human who I've received that kind of like love and care and support from, which is like heartbreaking, but it was just where I was um, when I started that practice. And it was really helpful to get the invitation to turn to the natural world and to really receive, you know, like treat nature as my benefactor and extend my loving kindness towards trees, towards animals, towards my dog, towards birds, like those were really easy accessible benefactors for me to work with. And I can remember over time as I continued with my loving kindness practice and was working with uh, the teacher I still work with, um, her name's Erin Treat. I was once on retreat with her, and so some years ago, definitely before the pandemic, maybe five years ago. And um, and I can remember like I was on this retreat and she was like offering the meta phrases. And I really realized like I can directly receive her good wishes to me here in this practice that she was guiding. But I noticed that just to feel like safe enough to receive them, I had to go all the way, like this is the meditation hall on this particular retreat center. There's two levels and there's kind of a loft. And I had to go all the way into the loft and find a couch to lay down on that was as far away from my teacher as possible. And somehow there, far away, I was able to receive, like receive her good wishes. And it was like, I had to create this, a little bit of distance just to feel safe enough to receive good wishes from, from my teacher. And, you know, and now as that time, you know, as I've worked with her more and I've held her more in my loving kindness practice and then in this seven homecomings practice where, you know, when I'm inviting in my teachers and mentors and guides, she's one of the people who always shows up for me. It's now feels like just such an easy flow of, that I just receive. I know that she cares for me, that she supports me, that she's so invested in my well being and my liberation. And, and that just like is now an easy flow. But that took, you know, from first starting benefactor practice to where I am now, it's been over a decade of practice. So it almost sounds a little discouraging to say it that way. But at the same time, it's something that as I've kept with it and really cultivated this piece of receiving, it's become more and more and more available to me. And now feels just like so nourishing. So I just share that to say, you know, that I think that this practice of receiving, it's not always the piece that's emphasized in the loving kindness practice, but this practice that Lama Rod offers the seven homecomings practice for me is also a loving kindness practice but it has the emphasis on us receiving the loving kindness as opposed to us sending out the loving kindness and of course both directions are are fantastic but we can't um for me it's been really important to emphasize this piece around receiving because that wasn't initial that was initially kind of blocked for me because of my own early experience of neglect, not receiving the care that I needed. So I just wanna say like this piece of, of home, homecomings, care, it's all pretty loaded. And, and um, you know, if you perhaps are like kind of reacting to some of these words, I would be like, yeah, of course, of course. Um, that can be really loaded because of our own lived experiences. And for me, even just the word home has taken, it's taken a long time for me to feel really comfortable with that word. I can remember, you know, when I first came to East Bay Meditation Center, I think it was like 2008. And I remember one of the early times I was there and my teacher, Larry Yang, made the invitation, you know, I invite you to consider the East Bay Meditation Center, one of your spiritual homes, I was really like, really struck by that language. I was like, home, what does that even mean? Like at that time, it was very hard for me to even have a felt sense of what home meant because 
because I had no sense of like stable, consistent home as I was growing up. And as an adult, though, I've been very stable. <laughs> um, I haven't been in my place for a very long time because I do have such a long for that home, that stability. And, and I, yeah, I was so struck by that invitation from Larry. And I just, I think it just immediately sparked this longing in me. Like I actually really long for a spiritual home. I really long for that refuge that's being offered. And I really met that even though I didn't know what it meant. And even though it took me some time to really have the felt sense of coming to EBMC, whether physically or on Zoom and really feeling at home, really feeling like this is a place where all of me is welcome, um, a place where I have a community where I feel like I am in reciprocity, that I'm offering care and receiving care. And of course it's, you know, imperfect and messy, so messy, but that, but that home is there, that, home, that felt sense of home really is there for me now. And I'm so grateful for that invitation, even though I didn't really know what the invitation meant. So, you know, I like offer the homecomings um, in that same spirit. It may be that as I'm offering it, it doesn't resonate or it feels like it even lands with some discomfort, but you wanna to continue to offer it because I think there is real liberation in this practice of really turning to receiving from our benefactors. I'm gonna dedicate the merit. So just inviting us to take a few breaths together. Just taking a moment, just a few moments of silence, a pause to come back to our sensations back to ourselves and maybe we were here this whole time maybe just feel our connection with the earth again and recognizing the goodness of our being together here the goodness of our practice the goodness of cultivating care, support, reciprocity, relationship. And just gathering up all of this goodness that we've created tonight in the Sangha and offering it out to the world. Offering this merit to all who need it, all who may be suffering, offering it to those impacted by wildfires right now in Canada and the US, offering it to all transgender expansive people in states where their rights and care are being taken away, offering it just to all of us who are struggling right now. May this merit, may what we've created here tonight in our practice be a balm, be a support to liberation in our communities and beyond. And sending out our good wishes, may all beings be safe and protected. May all beings be seen, cared for, supported, known, recognized. May all beings experience well-being, peace, ease, and may all beings everywhere be free. And inviting the bell. <laughs>